Psalm 37, <clears throat> verse 25. You ready? Let's read it together. There we go. Ready? Read. I have been young. Now I'm old. Well, okay, hold on. I'm a little older. <laughs> Say it with me. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. Verse 26. All day long he is gracious and lives and his descendants. Yeah. The he is gracious is not God. That's us. You get it? David says, I was young, now I'm older. I've never seen righteous forsaken, nor his children begging. All day long, talking about the righteous, he's gracious, and he gives, he lends. And his descendants, his children, are a blessing. All right, Father, thank you for this opportunity to share your word and uh, help me not to mess it up, not to mess up anything. Help me remain integral to the responsibility and then also into the moment, I give you praise that you're going to say things that I didn't plan for you to say. And we're going to receive things we didn't plan to receive. I thank you, Lord, this room has been prepped for the anointing. But you've already stretched the walls out for you. You've made the room big enough to handle this level of revelation. I give you praise for it now in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. You all can be seated. On the way down, you can repeat this after me. We're going to make bread again. Yeah, so make bread part one, make bread again. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all ready for this? I'm going to teach this out a little bit. I'm not going to do a whole lot of hollering unless I get, you know, uh, sanctified real quick. And then, <laughs> and then we'll jump into it. All right, take good notes, and, uh, and we're going to see what God does. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for reminding me about that. All right. Y'all ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. All right, so um, this is Black History Month, and this is a, an important month started by a man by the name of Carter G. Woodson, who began this month as Black History Week, actually, initially. Then it became Black History Month. It was an opportunity for people of color, specifically African Americans, to actually highlight or be highlighted or to shine the light on the achievements of black folk in America. And uh, it was fought with a lot of resistance and et cetera, like most things initially, especially in that time, but eventually became something that people of color and even people who are not African American could enjoy and could take a moment to reflect on. So we have just entered into that beautiful month that, uh, you know, that people have tried to hijack with Valentine's Day, praise God, but this is all about black history, amen? So in tribute to black history, I want to kind of tell you a little bit of story, uh, if I may, for a few moments. Can I bother you with that? In the first two decades, you want to talk to me today? Please do. In the first two decades of the 20th century, Tulsa, you can put a picture up, Tulsa transformed a, uh, from a dusty frontier into a thriving metropolis. I sent that earlier, hopefully you got it, into a thriving metropolis. There, did you see it? This is pictures of the Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I won't get into the, all the details of that because we don't have time, but we all know that this place was burned down through the race riots in Tulsa in 1921. Uh, but let, before I get into that part, let me just share this with you. Tulsa had transformed from a dusty frontier into a thriving metropolis, and a man by the name of Gusher, everybody say Gusher, was pretty much the architect of this movement. And uh, after Gusher was discovered, and the city soon became the oil uh, capital of the world. And Gurley's Greenwood began to boom with it. And in 1910 and 1920, Tulsa's population uh, nearly quadrupled from more than 72,000 people. And the black population rose from below 2,000 to almost 9,000 people. So it began to become an a, a, a influx of African American people that were coming to this particular area. And in 1920, a walk through Black Wall Street, that's what they nicknamed this place, meant traversing more than 35 bustling city blocks. You know what I'm trying to tell you? 35 city blocks was known as Black Wall Street. Yeah. With, the full, with the locust being the intersection of Greenwood Avenue and Archer Street, adjacent to Tulsa's Frisco Rail Tracks. 
And there was a place owned by another black builder, uh, the Acme Brick Company, that actually supplied building materials to the townhouses, apartments, theaters, and hotels that lined the streets. However, in that context, as they begin to boom, none of this stuff happened without the presence of a church called Mount Zion. And Mount Zion was a church that was built around 1903, I believe. And this particular church, Mount Zion, was the superstructure of that time. And many of its members were the people that actually built this community that we knew as Greenwood at that time. The partners and members and parishioners of this particular expression and a few other churches in that area put their monies together on a regular basis to build banks, to build movie theaters, to build pools, pool halls, to build clubs, to build uh, all types of things, groceries and etc. They begin to pull their money together as resources to fund their community. And because of segregation, the money turned over in the community and never left. The money turned over several times over in their community and rarely had to go outside of that context. And why is that? Well, segregation is part of that. But because they turned the money on, turned the money over within a Christian community or communities or people who belong to these churches, these churches began to help other churches grow their churches. So it wasn't just Mount Zion, but other churches now began to have the resources from those who belong to other churches helping finance other churches. Look at the kingdom expression there. They begin to boom and they begin to grow. And then because of racism, uh, it was turned, it was literally burnt to a crisp. People lost everything. But Mount Zion, though it lost its brand new superstructure, it opened up its superstructure of April of 1921. And by the time uh, it got to August, I believe, of 21, the particular, the whole thing was burnt down to a crisp. And all the people had left was the basement. Everybody say the basement. They called the basement a brand new beginning. Because it's in the basement that they begin to have church to rebuild their entire structure all over again. This is history. This is the idea and the context of how important that Black Wall Street would not have happened had it not been for believers putting their money into what they believe was the vision of their leaders and the vision that was necessary for the community to benefit from that church. Somebody say amen to this. There's a people that I like to, uh, I love African culture. I love all things African culture. I love culture and I love history, period. It doesn't matter what history, what culture it is. It could be uh, Israeli history. It could be uh, African history. It could be uh, German history, whatever. I love history. But there's a particular people that I've, I'm learning to fall in love with. They're called the Malawi people. Shout Malawi. Malawi. And there's a guy named Augustine Chingwala Musopole who actually wrote a book called Umutu Theology. Umuntu theology. And Umuntu, am I boring y'all? Umuntu theology is a discipline or critical reflection of the African experience of God in the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everybody say Umuntu. I told you you black today. Say Umuntu. <laughs> One of the excerpts says, as, as he talks about generosity in the greedy world, he says, in everyday life in Malawi, Umuntu means to be generous. Everybody say generous. And among the Lomwe people of the southern Malawi, a people indigenous to this writer, the children are taught from infancy that generosity is what Umutu looks like in real life. Generosity is what Umutu looks like in real life. To be a self-giving person for the good of the community is what comes to most people's mind when someone said to have Umutu. You have Umutu. Umutu means you are a generous person. You could be a child and have Umutu. I love that. You could be an umutu. Oh, this person, oh, he's umutu. That's what that means, that they are a generous person. Shout generous person. Uh-huh. And so a part of that community, the Chewes people, uh, of the Malawi people, have a proverb that says, Patse, patse, nuklanda, moana, ufulu, aziwa yake. Which translates... All right, all right. <laughs> I'm supposed to get on right through here, all right? What it translates is, it says forcing someone to give you equal, ex forcing someone to give to you 
equals extortion. The free know to give without being asked. I'll say it again. That phrase that I quoted, I'm not going to say it again, is forcing someone to give you, to give to you equals extortion. If they believe the Malawi, if I got to force you to give it, I'm extorting you. Mm -hmm. But the free, who, Lord Jesus, those who are free, those who are free, those who are without limitations, those who are free, they know how to give without being asked. <laughs> So theologically, this kind of generosity is in line with God's sacrificial gift of God's only son for the salvation of humanity. It's in this sense that God is actually known to the Malawi people, you ready for this, as the great Umuntu. He's the great Umuntu. That's who he is. He's the generous one. The Lord Jesus. He's a generous God. Everybody say it again, Umuntu, Umuntu. I want to run over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 real quick. Are y'all getting this today? 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Let me read this to you real quick. This is, uh, thank you, Father, I feel your presence. This is um, the New Limit Translation, starting around verse 1, chapter 9, verse 1. I want you to read this with me. And uh, we didn't get to this last week, but let's, let's rock this out. Y'all ready? Paul writes to the church of Corinth. This is a, hear me, this is a gifted church. And I've been saying this for years. They're not only gifted, but they have money. They have resources. Corinthians actually were quite wealthy. Not the entirety, but they were wealthy. Even the Jews that had belonged to this particular tribe, or this particular church, were also very wealthy. It's a heavy Gentile church, but there are Jews or Israelites that are part of, Hebrews that are part of this culture as well. Paul says, I really don't need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem. He says, I don't need to do this. But for I know how eager you are to help, Umutu. And I have been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you and Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. But I am sending these brothers to be sure you are ready. Oh, Lord. Do you hear that? To be sure that you are ready. As I have been telling them that your money is all collected, um, yeah, I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. <laughs> we would be embarrassed, not to mention your own embarrassment. If some Macedonian believers came with me and found out that you weren't ready after all I had told them. Paul be writing. So I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promise is ready. But I want it to be a willing gift. Ubuntu. Not one giving grudgingly. We going somewhere. Remember this. A farmer. Read this with me. Y'all ready? He says, remember this. Remember this. Now understand that this culture in this time, agriculture is big. Agriculture is big. Most men were farmers. Uh, most men were farmers. They planted. That's what they did. This was the culture at that time. Barter systems and etc. He says, a farmer who plants only a few seeds would get what? A small crop. Look at somebody and say, don't believe God for big. And you barely sow. Now I'm going to teach us how to move the needle. Because this is not just something that I had to learn, and I had to learn the hard way. I was definitely very tight in, I, I, years ago, not now, but very, I wasn't as generous as I am now. But it took time to get to that place. So I'm not, I'm not rebuking you. I'm and challenging us to get to a whole other level of, of generosity. Are you here? So if you don't sow, if you don't sow a lot, you ain't going to reap a lot. Y'all, this is just how the principle works. All right? I'm not saying something that's not in your scripture, all right? This ain't the KIV version. Because the KIV version said, they don't give, destroy them. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Take their breath. <laughs> You're supposed to still be <laughs> I'm just teasing. We got grace. <laughs> Only a few seeds get a small crop. Look, it says, but the one who, read it with me, ready? But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you plant, he says, if he's saying, if you give generously, if you have umutu, if you do that, you're going to get umutu. That means you get the God of generosity to be a blessing to you. So you must decide in your heart how much to give. Look what it says, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need. 
and plenty left. Oh, Lord, y'all, some of y'all should have been shouting right here. God, so here's the promise. Are y'all here? He says, God loves a person who gives cheerfully. It, it, only in the church context, though, when as soon as we start talking about money, Oh, yeah, quiet. You didn't worship and got a breakthrough. Got your breakthrough and crying. Ah, thank you, Jesus. You know, they didn't lay hands on you. Ah. You You've gotten all you needed from the Lord. Then we say, it's time to get a seat in your hand. Your conservatism kicks in. Like, all of a sudden, now you're concerned about how much money you spend. Now, let's, I just... <laughs> but here's the principle. Here's the principle. Paul tells us, he says, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will have everything you need. He'll provide all that I need. Then I will have everything I need. And then plenty left over. To share with others. Not plenty left over to, 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 to go buy myself something extra, but plenty left over to be umutu. To learn how to share. To learn how to give to other people. Somebody say amen to this. Amen. Then he quote, then he has the audacity to lay, to cro- to quote a scripture. You hear me? He says, as the scripture says, read it with me. Come on, ready? Read. They share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered. Lord Jesus, you mean, hold on, hold on, hold on. Stop the press. You mean to tell me that there is some things that God will remember forever? Now, we know the sin issue has been dealt with. But there are things that we can do that God will remember forever. Oh, let me park up in here. Let me plant right here. Boom. That there are things we can do that God will remember forever. You know what he remembers forever? Our generosity. He remembers your sowing, your giving. He remembers us being generous with other people and being generous with the things that belong to God. Say amen to this. And now he keeps going, verse 10, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. Lord Jesus. In the same way, help me Holy Ghost, he will provide and increase your resources. Y'all need to read this text with me. And then produce a great harvest of generosity Now, let's read it again. Verse 10 and shout it to yourself until you upset your own flesh. For God is the one who provides seed, not your job. Not your network. Not your talent. Not the hookup. Not your rocket resume. Not your LinkedIn. Not your social media followers. Not your social media platform. Promotion does not come from people. Promotion comes from God. It doesn't come from the east or from the west. It comes from the Lord. You do what you got to do to be good at what you do. But when it happens, please know, they were forced to give it to you. Y'all quiet up in here. Everything I got, I got it because of him. Boy, Jesus. Everything, everything I'm able to do, I do it because of him. You got to have that mindset going into it. That I'm building some things, but God, if he don't breathe on it, nobody's face is going to turn in that direction. That's why we can't think we're better than other people. Because all of us need that same grace of God. If God don't look at what you're doing. So he provides, he'll provide an increase. Come on, read it with me. In the same way, shout it. He will provide. I need, I said shout it. He will provide. He'll increase my resources. What? Now, when he says this, he ain't limited to seed. I don't know about y'all, but I need some of my resources increased. And I'm not just talking about money. Uh Uh-uh. I'm talking about relationships. I'm talking about connectivity to the city. I'm talking about open doors to publishers. I'm talking about schools. Y'all quiet up in here. He will give me resources, avenues, ways to get wealth. Y'all quiet up in here. Witty 
That's that word. Witty inventions. He'll give you patents and things you can register. Things you can get copywritten. Your God is much brighter than you give him credit for. God's so good, he'll give you an idea ain't nobody ever thought of before. You say, well, how do you know that? Simply put, we all been preaching the same text for over 2,000 years. Well, maybe less than that. 1,500 years preaching the same text. Many of us. And we still all get fresh revelation. How can we say the same thing and still say fresh things about the? Because God is unlimited in resource of knowledge, information, revelation, intel. God will bless you. He wants to bless you. Look at somebody and say, he wants to bless me. He wants to bless me. No, tell somebody, he wants to bless me. <laughs> God don't want me struggling. He wants to bless me. Y'all quiet about me. He doesn't want me struggling. He wants to bless me. And it's going to take the audacity of faith. And you being brave enough to take a risk on you. As you trust him for information. God drops revelation on us. He gives us resources. He gives us ideas. He gives us dreams. He gives us visions. He gives us downloads. Yes, he does. He'll give you intruding thoughts. He'll give you open air visions. He'll give you ingenuity. He'll give you wisdom you didn't get out of a book. You'll walk in a room praying the Holy Ghost and be the smartest thing in the moment. Because when he sits on you, it's not your wisdom no more. You're just the donkey that's he hawing. But he's the one giving you grace and intel, revelation by the Spirit of God. I know what I'm talking about. I said, I know what I'm talking about. I walked in plenty of rooms I was not supposed to be in. And sat there and told mayors of this city, city council members, the wisdom of God. And then asked myself when I left, how did you get there and how did you know that? He'll give you resources. He'll give you resources. Slap yourself and say, he'll give me resources. God wants to give me resources. <laughs> give me ideas and dreams. So I'm a little emotional because I feel a breakthrough in the room. He gives me resources. He does. He gives me the power to get well. And I'm going to be like, oh, you know, preachers are always talking about money. No, we don't. Do you know there's more scriptures about money than heaven? There are more scriptures in the Bible about money than hell. There's a little bit on hell. And a little bit more on heaven. And then some of y'all got heaven mixed up with the kingdom of God. When I inherit the kingdom of God, got, got mixed up. On, they ain't talking about the sweet by and by. Yeah. It's talking about the rule of God on the earth. Yeah. I'll teach you. Don't worry about it. We're coming back to the kingdom this year. Don't worry about it. He says, I'm just in resources. And then produce, what are you going to do? He gives you the resources to produce a harvest of generosity. Yeah. Now, you know, listen, sometimes these power bowls, I think they call them power bowls. Powerballs, they get up to like <laughs> one point some billion. And I'll be riding down the highway like, Jesus, Lord have mercy. <laughs> what I would do with that. Let me tell you what I, I'm telling you. If, if I got one point three billion dollars, do you know all of y'all debts paid? Oh, you think I'm playing? If you at church, the day I get it, you're going to walk out this building. You ain't going to know I won because I'm not going to tell you I won. It's, it's going to be in the, it, you're not going to know it was me. <laughs> All you're going to know is somebody had blessed the church. And <laughs> you ain't going to know it's me. I'm paying off y'all's houses. What am I going to do with a billion dollars? I might as well umutu and make sure everybody got what they need. But you know why some of us ain't blessed? Because the first thing we think about is what we going to buy us. Lord, give me that power bowl. My whole church going up. 
You new whips outside? Debt free, all of y'all. I'm not kidding. I'm paying off your student loans. Lord, bless me. I'm paying off your student loans. You ain't going to have to worry about that no more. Who took care of it? Some trust. What's it called? Legacy trust. They just gave me some money and paid it all off. <laughs> the next week, though, you have a church full of people. Well, you know, <laughs> folk who ain't been to church in three years. Well, you know, Apostle, you always been my pastor. Just... <laughs> It's the walk. <laughs> Look at somebody said, be generous, be generous. He says, if you, I'm still in the text, y'all. I'm still in the text. And then produce a great harvest. He says, I'm going to bless you so it produces a harvest of generosity in you. In, in us, I want to be generous. I want to change somebody's life. Are y'all here? You want to, I want to send kids to school. I want parents to be like, my child is excellent, but I don't have the resources. Don't worry about that. We how much you need. We got this first two, three semesters. They'll get a scholarship the rest of it. That's how you change lives. Amen? You pay off debt. That's how you do it. I want to, well, I'm getting off the text a little bit, but I want to make sure we are in position. Where well, you falling behind on your, your lease? All right. We got six months that we just took care of you. you. If you ain't found a job in six months, come see me. That's generosity. Umutu. It's Black History Month. Umutu. There you go. Y'all going to be saying that all day long, right? <laughs> I learned my African word for the day. Now I know two. <laughs> Kwanzaa and Umutu. <laughs> Kwanzaa is not even a real African word, but maybe it is. I don't know. <laughs> Swahili, I think, something like that. <laughs> Matthew 6. Matthew 6. You guys got it? Matthew 6. All right, let's throw that up there on the screen. I want you to look at the New Living Translation of Matthew 6. Look, now, look what Jesus says to, to look, what, look what Jesus says. First of all, oh, this is a whole other version right here. I like this verse. Verse, verse 19. Verse 19, okay. Press verse 1. Verse 19. There it is. All right. Watch out. All right, here we go. Read it with me. Ready? Read. Don't store up treasures here on earth. Pause. Don't store up treasures here. Jesus said, don't, don't put too much stock into this. Where moths eat them. Yeah. That word moth there is actually speaking about clothes moth. It's actually about clothes moth. It's, it's the eastern treasures <clears throat> consisting partly in costly dresses stored up. So it's talking about costly apparel. In other words, don't spend all your money wearing name brand everything. Now, I'm going to say something. I'm going to say something. I've been to say something. All right? All right, you ready? If you can't afford that, don't buy that. I don't care if it's Louis Vuitton, Dolce and Cabana, because people that got money, they also know the difference. Dolce and Cabana don't make windsuits. They go, pss, pss, pss. they don't make them. That's not real. They don't make matching top and bottom short sets for Louis Vuitton. They don't make that. That's not real. They don't make Louis Vuitton Nikes. Those aren't real. That's not out yet. They made those in China. As President Trump would say, made those in China. <laughs> That's not real. What we do, though, is we like to look like we have it. And, and we are behind in our bills. 
We're not paying our stuff on time. But I got a Miri on. Givenchy. Right? But we don't, we don't, but we don't own nothing but this sweater. You better watch one of them GRWMs and get ready with me. And them people that be getting ready with me with wearing the Walmart and Target stuff and be out there putting it on. You hear me? I mean. And be killing. And hundred dollars. And own their house. Own they own their stuff. Look at somebody and say, quit impressing people that's not paying you no attention. Because after you wear it, you can't wear it again. We already seen it. Find another trick. It's Black History Month. I'm talking to you today. Sick of it. Sick of it. Two billion dollars of our resources. Two point eight nine billion of your money funds this economy. We are the number one consuming group in the world. It's Black History Month. Let me talk to you. Can I be your pastor for a moment? We're the number one consuming group in the world. Our money lives in our community less than 30 minutes. I believe I saw something the other day that said 22 minutes. Just like that. In the Hispanic community, it may stay over for a little bit. Matter of fact, to my Hispanic brothers and sisters, I see, look, you hear that manifest? And <laughs> manifesting. In the Hispanic community, they've come up they've seven times over in the last few years economically. People say, well, we don't want to do that. Da, da. No, doing what they got to do. Taking care of their family. Getting their education. Working their job. And not having an attitude when it's time to... It's Black History Month. I got to talk to us for a moment. Excuse me, folks. Just let me just deal with this. We pull up to Chick-fil-A or pull up to a restaurant. You chose this job. Why are you sweet to them and then nasty to me? Sis. You chose this job. You better be happy you got this job and let God promote you while you're here. A sense of entitlement in this generation. Everybody owe you something. Don't want to work for you, just owe it to me. You want to sit at home and just do social media all day long and then expect to be blessed. You don't sow, you don't give, you just complain about everybody with your fake profile pictures and your missing faces. And the full page is created to torment somebody else. Sit back with a critical eye and just dog everybody out on social media who's actually trying to do something. Don't store up treasures here on earth where the clothes moths eat it up and the rust destroys them. That rust means to be consuming them. It's the wear and tear. Because these jeans fade. Uh -huh. I, I found out personally that $200 jeans, they fade actually like the ones at $6,999. <laughs> one time I messed around and put one of my nice t-shirts with an Egyptian cotton and threw that mug in the washer and guess what it did? The same thing. It just put it in, took it out, it was young. It became Trip's church. Trip, Trip's shirt. 
<laughs> Can I keep going? So Jesus said, and y'all forgive me, we, we got to do this. Jesus said this, he says, he says, instead, store your treasures in heaven. Yeah. Verse 20. Where moths and rust cannot destroy. You see how you do that? Seed is how you do that. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, and thieves do not break in and steal it. Yeah. You can't steal seed. You know why? Because even if I was crooked, which I am not. Yeah. But even if I was crooked, which I am not. I don't look at, I don't count, I don't see none of that. Yeah. You ain't going to ever have that on Apostle Duhar. Yeah. Never. Yeah. Never. Yeah. Never. Because yeah. I like me and I like my name. <laughs> so, so, so he says, so when you, so, so if we did something wrong, which we don't, but let's say we did, God still remembers what you sold. See, that's why I don't go to church. That's why I don't give because this is it. That's all right. You can be not, you can just do what you're doing. Fine. Ain't nobody talking to you anyway. But for those that are apart, even if somebody mishandled something, God still remembers what you say and still will bless you even if somebody tried to take it because in heaven they can't steal his memory they can't take what he knows are y'all here verse 21 wherever your treasure is say when wherever your treasure is is where your heart is your heart you want to know where your where your heart is i've said it for years look at your bank account some of us love Uber Eats. Some of us love Shein. <laughs> Team <Timu>. Moo. <laughs> Amazon Prime. Goat. So where my treasure is, where my heart is, Didi. Where my treasure is, that's where my heart is. If I look at where I'm spending my money on, that's what I love. If, if, if I love everything else more than I love the church or what he's, the kingdom, that's a problem. That's all I'm saying. If I love me more than I love the kingdom, that's a problem. That's, and that's, I think what it's saying is I don't want to partner with God. I'd rather partner with me. Which is your prerogative. You're not in sin if you do that. I'm not calling it sin. Maybe a little bit, but, you know, but I, what I am saying for certain is that what it is is stingy. So maybe that's the sin. And it's not trusting. And God wants to trust him with our seed. Amen? Amen. Can I keep moving? Yeah. All right, if I offend, you'll be all right. So let's talk about this thing called the tithe. Let's set the record straight on that. Y'all ready? Yeah. All right, so the tithe is a principle. We teach it as a principle because the tithe is something that God loves. Everybody say this with me. The tithe, tithe. Is, blessed. is blessed. It's blessed, though. Yeah. The tithe is blessed. The tithe is blessed. It was blessed before the law. Amen? It means tenth. Tenth. But can I give you another revelation, another uh, definition of that word tithe, asad in Hebrew? Literally means to be rich. It doesn't just tithe is tithe is tenth, but the meaning is to be rich. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Asad literally means to be rich, to be wealthy. The tithe is to be wealthy. Literally. It 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 it, it is the tenth, it means to be wealthy. Did I say that right? So the tithe is a token brought to honor the Lord and to recognize him as the owner of all. So it means if I give him a tenth of this, I'm saying he owns it all, but I'm going to give my father this. He owns it all, but I'm going to give him this. Now, let me set the record straight. Are you cursed if you don't tithe? According to Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, the answer is no. Jesus Christ became your curse, Galatians, so that you, he became your curse. Cursed is any man that hangs upon a tree. He became your curse. So that curse does not have anything to do with us. Number two, number two, you ready? Can I just teach this out? Number two, number two is this, is that Jesus, watch this, 
that when the law was written, the law was not written to, it was written to Jews, wasn't written to Gentiles. So the 613 laws are not my law. It's not my covenant. Does that make sense? Because if it was, some of us already messed up when we went to Papa Do's. That's, it's a wrap. Some of us messing up in here because I know this fabric don't match this one. It's a wrap. You got it? All right. So with that being said, are you cursed if you didn't tithe? No. But are you missing out on a principle that God loves? Yes. So I tithe because I know this principle works. And it has never, it has, now watch this. As long as I managed my end, God has always increased me. Because I work the principle of tenth aside to be, real, to be wealthy. I work a principle personally. I work a principle. I was sending this. I'm, I'm bringing my tithe. You don't pay your tithe. Are y'all here? It's not a tax. <laughs> it's not a club interest fee. No. <laughs> you partner with God by bringing your tithe, then God, God says, okay, you've recognized me as the owner of all. So I'll t I will bless this. You manage it, and I'll increase it. How do you do it? That's none of your business. And I've learned that that's none of my business, and I'm okay with it not being my business. Because then I don't have to worry about how it's going to get it done. I just do what I'm supposed to do, manage what I have left over, and trust him to keep increasing me. But at the end of the year, I keep looking up and being like, how did he do that? How did you do that? That's none of your business, the how. All I know is, is God says to the prophet Malachi, and this is old covenant, but he says to Malachi, he says, man, tell Israel that, uh, to tithe. And tell them, I said, bring me my tithe. Bring the tithe. He says, and I'll open up a window. That word window is, and I've said it for years, is a lattice. It means like a, like a swinging door on top of a chimney. It's a lattice. It swings this way. When the smoke fills up, it blows out. That lattice door opens up. That's what he said the blessing is like. I got so much stored up for you that when you tithe, it opens that door. And we think blessing me, blessings. He'll, pour, he'll give me blessings. I don't need blessings. I need a blessing. He says, I can give you a blessing that you don't have capacity to handle. Translation, you don't have room enough to receive. You don't have enough capacity to handle the kind of blessing I'll give you when you partner. Man, I wonder what it's like to be blessed by God that I don't even have capacity for it. Ooh, what kind of blessing is that? Because many of us experienced it. We were blessed and we're like, man, how did we get here? It's just what it is. Can I keep going? All right, so the custom of tithing was common amongst the Semitic people at that time. And uh, annotated the Mo it annotated the Mosaic Law, with Mosaic Law, which means it was before the Mosaic Law. Say this when the tithe was before the Mosaic Law. I got eight minutes. Can I break this down? When we see the tithe, we see it in Genesis chapter uh, 1, 2, and 3, right? But I'm not going to argue that. Let's just go to the first time we actually see the word tithe. Of course, it's, this, it's found in Genesis, I believe it's chapter, uh, Genesis chapter 14, yeah. Genesis chapter 14, uh, you can turn it if you want to, but I'll, I'll just summarize this. It says that after the return from the defeat of uh, Cheeto Lamar, I think I said that right. And the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, went out to meet him at the valley of Shave, uh, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem. Say this with me. Melchizedek, Melchizedek. king of Salem. What did he do? He brought our bread and wine. It says, now we have a priest of God. Now, he was a priest of most high God. Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessed of heaven and earth. And blessed be the God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him a tenth of all. So Melchizedek is a king who, according to Jewish customs, Jewish laws, Jewish traditions, which is true, Melchizedek has no recording of his mother or father. We just know he is the man. He's a king. We don't know how, we have, there's no records on him. There's no, no history of who, he is, who, his, who his people are, what his line age is, etc. All we know is Abraham or Abram went to battle, came out, won, and the spoil that he and his soldiers took, he gave a tenth of his portion to Melchizedek because he believed that Melchizedek was greater than him. He gave him a tenth portion. Again, no mother, no father, 
no records. All we know is he is a priest forever. That's what they say. He's a priest forever. Now, according to Hebrews chapter 7, let's run there, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. I'm going to read for a few minutes. This particular scripture is very interesting, or this particular book, because the person who wrote this letter, or this book to the letter to the Hebrews, is a person who's very familiar with the, the law and the customs, especially that of the temple and the tabernacle, okay? He's very, very, very entrenched in this. Uh, it is not Paul. This writer is very, very astute as it pertains to, and to the principles of the, of the tabernacle. You ready? Look what it says. It says, this Melchizedek was king of the, of the city of Salem and also a priest of God most high. When Abraham was returning home after winning a great battle against the kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. Then Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in battle and gave it to Melchizedek. Everybody say the tithe. The, tithe. the name Melchizedek means what? King and king of Salem means what? Because he was Melchizedek, king of Salem. There is, so he was Melchizedek, which means king of what? Justice. Come on, y'all talk to me, justice. And he's the king of Salem, and Salem means the king of what? So there's no record, here it is, of his mother or father or any of his ancestors. No beginning or end to his life. He remains a priest forever. Here's the revelation. Resembling the son of God. So Abraham tied to a person who resembled the son of God. But this is what's so interesting because Abraham tied to him, but not just Abraham. So did the entire priesthood. Because the priesthood who actually came uh, through Aaron, the brother of Moses, and we find this in the wilderness, that priesthood, all of them were inside of Abraham. Because Abraham is the father of that nation. So because they were inside of Abraham's loins, when he tied to Melchizedek, a man with no records, no who's priest forever, and they're inside of him, they tied to him as well. Which means the law is weaker than that revelation. The law was through Moses, but Moses and them were inside of Abraham. So the principle of tithing had begun early on, but the progenitor of their faith had already displayed. So they already gave to the covenant of revelation, manifestation. They already gave through the covenant of revelation before they gave through the law. Which one's greater? Let's argue it. You ready? Verse 4, consider then how great Melchizedek was. Even Abraham, the great patriarch of Israel, y'all with me? Recognize this by giving him a tenth of what had been taken in battle. Now, the law of Moses required that the priests who are descendants of Levi, they must do what? They must collect. Come on, Bible readers. They must collect what? From who? Who are also the descendants of Abraham. But Melchizedek, was, who was not a descendant of Levi, collected a tenth from Abraham. And Melchizedek, and it's not Levi, it's Levi. And Melchizedek placed a blessing, it is, upon Abraham, the one who had already received the promises of God. And without question, the person who, was the, who, who has the power to give a blessing is greater than the one who is blessed. Look at it, verse 8. The priests who collect the tithes are men who die. So Melchizedek is greater than that than they are because we're told that he lives on. In addition, we might even say that these Levites or Levites, the one who collected the tithe, paid a tithe to Melchizedek. Here's the proof. When their ancestor Abraham paid a tithe to him. For although Levi wasn't born yet, the seed from which he came was in Abraham's body. When Melchizedek collected the tithe from him. So if the priesthood of Levi, on which the law was based, could have achieved the perfection God intended, why did God need to establish a different priesthood with a priest? In the order of Melchizedek instead of the order of Levi and Aaron. And the priesthood is changed. The law must also be changed to permit it. For the priest we're talking about belongs to a different tribe. Whose members have never served at the altar as priests. What I mean is this. Our Lord came from the tribe of Judah. And Moses never mentioned a priest coming from that tribe. Now look at verse 15. Y'all read it with me. Ready? Let's do it together. This change has been made very clear since a different priest who is like Melchizedek has appeared. Jesus became a priest. Come on here. Not by meeting the physical requirement of belonging to the tribe of Levi, but by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. And the psalmist pointed this out when he prophesied, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. 
So David writes and sings a song by revelation. He gets it by revelation. He gets it by revelation. I ain't got time to preach that out. I wish I could. He gets it by revelation that Jesus is the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Look at verse 18. Yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless. But the law never made anything perfect. But now we have confidence. Come on, y'all, Bible readers, in a better hope. This new system was established with a solemn oath. Aaron's descendants became priests without such an oath. But there was an oath regarding Jesus. For God said to him, the Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. You are a priest forever. So because of this oath, Jesus now is the one who guarantees a better covenant with God. There were many other priests under the old system, for death prevented them from remaining. In other words, every other priest died that they tied to. However, because of Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. When we tithe by principle, we're tithing to our priest. Your priest is not Kevin Dwayne Duhart Sr. I'm going to die. We tithe to him. I bring my tithe to him. If you decide to practice that principle. But that is a principle that can get you blessed. Are oh, y'all got it? Can I keep going or not? Want me to turn my plow? Turn my plow? Okay. So when I make bread, when I partner with God, when I find ways to give, when I, when I, when I hear, let me show you how to do it. When I feel impressed upon the Lord, because what happens is our flesh negotiates. God be like, be like, it's receiving time in the house of God. Hey Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Or, <laughs> and the Lord is say, hey, I want you to sow insert amount. And you negotiate. But I, but I want to do this. But I want to go do this. But I want to buy this. Oh, I just want to have this in my account. You know you're going to spend it anyway, but you, 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 we tell ourselves, come on, y'all. Well, I've already given for the month. I've already really, I've already really done that. I, I mean, like you can really just feel satisfied with giving to God. Like you, how can we ever feel like, oh, I did enough? Like, God, you could take, as Jodas said, take my money, my house, and my cars. <laughs> You can take it all. Take my breath. Because he does. He takes my breath away. He literally does. You can, you can, you can. So, so you'll get this moment where you'll be like, okay, I need to see. This is how it works. I need to see. I need to give. And then all of a sudden we tell ourselves, okay, I need to give, but, but, but I got this. I need to give, but, but I got this. I got to give, but, but what about, what about this? What about that? And when, when we negotiate, we miss the moment for the window. Because what you don't know is on the other side of God's ask was something he was about to release. Not because you, it's because of your obedience. Because he's, he's not testing your, your, your mind, he's testing your heart. He's, he's looking at your heart. He's looking at, at, at the heart a little bit. He said, hey, I'm trying to bless you. And I really want to make this happen for you, but, but you scared. You think I'm not going to give it back. You think that I'm going to lie to you and ask you for something and then not give it back to you? Who do you, who do you think I am? I'm not your mama. I'm not your daddy. I'm not your ex-boyfriend or ex-husband, ex-wife or ex-whatever. Baby mama, baby daddy. Baby people. I'm not these people. Just made that up. I'm not them. Manifestation. I'm not them. I'm, 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 I want to bless you. Look at somebody and say, God want to bless me. He wants to bless me. I'm going to say it. God wants to bless me. God will tell you small things. Like, hey, pay for this person's coffee at Starbucks. And you'll be sitting there like, mm -mm. they too close to my car. I don't like the way they looking at me. You looking at them through the rear view mirror. You looking at that side mirror. And God's on the other side of that thing like, if you do this, 
Because he, he's, so, he's so kind. But I've learned by my father, he don't force feed you with it. He'll just suggest it. Hey, why don't you be nice and do this? Hey, why don't you get a seed and sow this? Hey, you know that word just blessed you. Why didn't you just give that seed? Hey, you told me, Lord, next week I'm sowing this. And then you negotiated when it was time to give. Don't, don't, come on, y'all. We all have done it. I'm, I'm not indicting. I did it. I don't do it now. Sometimes, listen, I remember the first time, okay, I can say this. I remember the first time somebody asked me to sow, the, the preacher had asked for a specific amount. He said, I need insert amount. I'm sitting there like, ooh, what a folk. So, <laughs> they said, there's 10 folk that can do it. I was like, ooh, 10 of them. So, uh, I'm praying right now. <laughs> Holy Ghost said, it's you. <laughs> Y'all seen what's happening? Remember Dee Dee? Remember Dwayne? Dwayne be like, no, uh I said, no, uh He said, no, it's you. It's you. I was like, I, I, but I just got that. <laughs> I, I just got that. You just gave it to me. <laughs> he said, I want you to sow it. You're the 10th person. No. I was afraid. But Umutu kicked in. I said, all right, if he's asking, I know his voice about everything else. This is his voice here. So I gave it. I gave it. I stood up. People clapping. Hey, praise God. Praise God. Uh, Pastor Duhart's going to just, you know, like, yeah, I'm looking, looking like. <laughs> Everybody else is excited because they're used to the, this level of getting, not me. I'm not used to this. I'm not used to this. We don't do this. I gave it. Got on a plane, came back to San Antonio, got back to San Antonio, standing in the parking lot talking to some guys. And between the two guys talking to me, they said, hey, the Lord led me to do this today. And they gave me double what I sold. <laughs> Same day. I left that city around noon, got to San Antonio, was standing in the parking lot of the building at 7 p.m., and they blessed me. Because I didn't know what was on the other side. God said, I'm trying to get that to you. You worry about just managing this right here. I'm trying to get that to you. So when you partner with God, there's several things you have to know. Write this down. I'm taking some time real quick. I got to help us just, just receive this. Number one, write this down or just say it with me. The flow of abundance with the ability to store and save, that comes on me. Yeah. When you partner with God, the flow of abundance. Shout the flow of abundance. It's not just abundance. It's the flow. We need a flow. When God made Adam, Adam, red clay, when he made clay man, red man, when he put the red man in the earth, that man was surrounded by water. Four streams. Pishon, Ginon, Haleo, and um, uh, Havila. Havila and, uh, and Ginon, Pishon. Havila, I'm missing one. Uh, Euphrates, which means fruitfulness. We were surrounded by four rivers. Each river had a different stream. Some were strong, some were uh, flowing strong, some were rapid, and some were bursting forth. Adam was made in the midst of four streams. Every believer should have four streams. Every believer should have four streams in your house. That's the goal, okay? Well, I'm, it's me by myself. Even more for you to sow. Four streams. Say it with me. Four streams. Look at somebody say, I'm working on four streams. Y'all need y'all receiving this? Some of y'all looking at me like. Well, then to you, I'm not talking to you. But for those that want to receive that, four streams. And God will give you the ability to flow in that level of abundance. He, he wants to, he's not intimidated by you having it. If we say, hey, like right now, I need a screen. We need a screen. Not these TVs. Shout out to the TVs. They've carried us through. But we need a screen. A screen going to ring about 30000 I should be able to say, I need 30 people. 
to give us $1,000 so we can buy that strength. And then a week later, it's up there on the wall. You did it for your church. Well, how does that benefit? It benefits everything. It changes everything online. The people who are watching, the, 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 it's seamless. It looks good in, in, in the house, and it's your church. Oh, Lord. So when you partner with God, you got it. When you, put out, when you, when you partner with God, the, it's the flow, start, I get the flow of abundance and the ability to store up and save. That's when I partner with God. You know what else he gives you? He takes away the desire of your enemies to hurt you when you partner. Oh, I got Bible for it. Exodus chapter 34, 23 says, Three times a year all your males are to appear before the Lord the God, the God of Israel. For I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your borders, and no man shall covet your land when you go up three times a year to appear before the Lord. You should not offer the blood of my sacrifice of with leavened bread, nor is the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover to be left until morning. You shall bring the very first of the first fruits of your soil into the house of the Lord, and you shall not boil a young goat in the mother's milk. Principle is this. I will drive out nations and enlarge your borders. And in the land you won't, nobody else can cover it. I'll fix the desire, not to touch what belongs to you. Oh, yeah, you know what I'm trying to tell you? I said, Lord, I need that land next door if we're going to be here. <laughs> a man owns that land. He owns World, World Car. He owns it for like, he wants to sell it for $7 Because he wants that land, he wants the whole frontage. So everything that go around this city block, this little block of big car, everything going to your left, all that down there to the frontage, where that little club is, horizons, all that kind of stuff. He said, I'll sell all that for $7 million. He won't, he won't just give the land separately. Because he could buy the land separately. But he's like, nah, I want, I want to set the whole thing. Well, okay. All right. All right. Well, nobody else can cover it while I'm sowing. And then God needs you to change his mind. Seven million too much. Not enough through traffic in the area. Be generous, Umuntu. Let the spirit of Umuntu come upon the man. Now I don't want to pay for it. Just give it to us. Number three, write this down. He'll expand my land holdings. When I partner with God, he expands my land holdings. God gives me land, houses I didn't build. Vineyard, y'all quiet up here. Vineyards I did. Listen, I'm, talking, I'm trying to teach you how to be blessed. He starts doing this stuff when you start partnering. This is how you make room. That's how you make bread. Number four, he will drive out oppositions to your increase. God will. When it comes to the principle of tithing, he said, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. I'll make room for you. So, oh, Lord, thank you. This is what the Spirit of God just showed me, and I'm done. A lot of times we try to do better, and you ever felt that sense like something's always trying to stop you? You ever notice that you had these seasons where you're like, I've been doing, and then all of a sudden everything tries to sap up my savings, take away from my, my operating budget. It's like, man, it's like. I was killing the game. All of a sudden, stuff starts trying to eat up, and it's like outside of your control. Right? Right? That's the devourer. And devouring is a spirit. And it shows up in certain seasons of abundance. But it really manifests itself, just like agriculture, in seasons where it feels like drought. Because when things dry up, it seems like everything starts falling apart, don't it? Don't it? God says, when you partner with me, I'll rebuke that. I, 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 I will deal with the opposition because there are oppositions to your increase. Sometimes the spirit of mammon, you loved it too much. Right? Sometimes it's our own discipline or lack thereof. And God, if he got to deal with you, like, hey, when are you going to finally get on top of your finances? Why do you spend like you just know you got money? You know, on the other side of this debit is seed. Are y'all here? I know we don't have paper money no more, but they keep records. Last thing. Say this with me. He will place his blessing on my house. Get ready to close this out, uh, prophet. Get ready to close this out. He will place his blessing on my house. He'll place his blessing on my house. Write this down, number six. 
Well, number seven, when you partner with him, it calls a supernatural supply in the kingdom of God. When you partner with God, it creates supernatural supply in the kingdom of God. Supernatural uh, supply in the kingdom of God. Supernatural. Start that with me. Supernatural supply in the kingdom of God. Did you get this word today? Look at somebody next to you and tell them, I got seed. I got seed right now. At different levels, though. We're all, it's not equal giving. It's not. It's equal sacrifice. It's not equal. It's equal sacrifice. Some of you have did the work. You're doing the work. And God has blessed you. you open for people. It's the conversations had about you when you're gone. Man, they changed my life. There, there are people that I know that we talk about that left so much legacy in the earth that we still talk about them 30, 40 years. My grandfather's one of them. Every time I go somewhere, people hear my last name, do hard. They be like, were you related to the, the late uh, superintendent? I'm like, yeah. That's my grandfather. Man, he changed my life. It's all the time. He's been gone since 1981. And it's 2024, and this year already somebody has talked to me about my grandpa. It's just, it's remarkable. Because, like Abraham, God will make your name great. You may not live to see it, but if you do what you're supposed to do, people will be talking about you. Not just by how the character of you, but even what you left in the earth. Thank you, Jesus. My job today is to push us to want to leave more than just some clothes and a GoFundMe. You are black history in the making. You got a whole cloud of people for years that's been waiting on you to arrive. I hope I'm pushing you. We can't just live like a bunch of thugs and smoke weed all day. Can't do that. That's deadbeat. That's deadbeat. I'll tell your mama it's deadbeat. That's deadbeat. We better than that. We better than that revelation. We better than that. Our grandkids, they deserve better than that. Our kids deserve way better than that. God didn't make, he's not making me the next NBA young boy. Nah, man, we better than just rap. We ain't just, we ain't just hip hop. Nah. Some of you are entrepreneurs. Builders, dreamers, you better than that. And you know what? Some of your family won't even do better until they see you do it. God's given you a dream. It fills you with a grace, an anointing. To get, the Bible says he's given us the power to get wealth. He ain't waiting for no politician. He ain't worried about Trump or Biden. We got the kingdom of God. My king is Jesus. 
care about Trump, Biden. I feel bad for this world system because people have to depend on it, but we don't. We have a kingdom system with surplus. Your God, as the old preacher said, owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He, he even owns the hills the cattle graze on. So we speak in tongues as the Spirit gives us utterance. We cast out devils, that's what we're called to do. We're people of dominion, authority, and power. But I refuse to be a charismatic expression broke. Sorry. One of my good friends, sir, uh, he's a, he's a, he owned his own um, consulting firm for credit unions. Good friend, good friend of mine. And uh, for the last three years, we've gotten, last four years, we've gotten really tight. His wife and I, we just got so tight. And uh, he's one of my closest friends now. And my brother sold his credit consulting firm because another credit union decided, or uh, asked him, would he consider coming out of retirement? Now, mind you, he's 40. Coming out of retirement from that part and coming back into the credit union game. So now he said yes. He's the CEO of one of the nation's uh, most creative credit unions in the country right now. And he's 40 years old, African American. And he told me, he said, bro, when you're ready, I will teach you and I will help your church on its own. One of my closest friends is a, is a consultant to banks. Now he's the CEO, again, his third time as CEO. All this was before 40. He just turned 40 this month, this past month. And told me, when you're ready, I'll send you the whole package, the whole thing. And I'll walk with whoever you put together so we can build that out in your church. I said, Lord, I need a rock credit union. We got to teach young people how to be responsible with their resources. So they don't have debt at 25 years of age. So they understand how to manage money, how to manage their families. So they don't give up. They feel defeated. Y'all feel that anointing? That's what God wants, man. He wants us to own it. Teach, teach kids entrepreneurship. It's too late for some folk, but it's not too late for this next generation. I know they're saying, the Generation Alpha and Generation Z, they didn't really go to church anymore. That's not my reality. I got everybody in there. X, Simon, Ye I got everybody. I don't know what they're talking about. It's not my revelation. My responsibility before I die is to make sure I push God's people to that next one. I don't care about no stages and platforms and all that stuff is cute. That's not what the, that's not what the kingdom's for. This is what the kingdom's for. Because when we own it, man, when we own it, and I'm able to make sure that you got what you need, when it's time for you to do what you got to do, young man, because we own it, and we're showing you how to do it, and you out here killing, and you sowing, and you partnering with God, and you making things happen for another generation, that's how you change it. Money answereth all things. And we got it. We got seed. We got to manage it better. Some of you need management mentors. Get one. Pretty soon, I don't know where he's at, but we are, in a couple of weeks, I'm putting mandates on it now. We're going to teach, and I'm going to open up on a Wednesday night, and I need you to be here to learn how to budget effectively. Instead of feeding your kids this fast food trash and the GMOs making them sick and wondering why we got a whole generation of cancer. We eat that stuff because it's cheaper, but then it's killing us. So what if we teach you how to eat right, but do it within a balanced budget? Make priority for life. For your kids. I'm done. I love y'all. We got to make room. Look at somebody say, we got to make room. We got to make room. Receive prophet Kwame.